our speaker tonight is John Delano. And Professor Delano got his PhD in geochemistry at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. And you might ask why we ask somebody who has a PhD in geochemistry to give, our fir to give one of our Skywatch lectures, which is leading into the International Year of Astronomy. Now we could go on about astrobiology, which most of us think of as, you know, good sci-fi or bad comic books. <laughs> one of the uh, things that they're trying to do with the International Year of Astronomy is to uh, make science more human, show people the real human side of it, what science is really like, what doing research is like, what living a life of science is really about. And Professor Delano does an outstanding job of that. And he's a distinguished teaching professor at SUNY Albany. And I think that starts giving you a better idea of what you're in for tonight. Um, he has a gift for taking things that are really incredible and showing you a picture of them that you can actually believe. And every time I hear him speak, I want to be a scientist. So take Thank it you. away. Thank, Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure. Can everyone in back hear me OK? Great, thank you. I'll, I'll probably get close to the microphone most of the time. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much to the Dudley Observatory for inviting me to speak. Uh, I would like to take you on a journey tonight and hope at the end of it to be able to persuade you that we live during one of the most exciting times in human history. NASA and the European Space Agency are embarked on attempting to answer some of the most profound questions in human history. Specifically, are we alone? That has been a question on the minds of philosophers, principally, over, the, over the many millennia. And they've all weighed in, many of them have weighed in, on the answer uh, to that, that profound question. However, of course, the information that they have drawn on has been largely, why would God have created such a large universe if he wasn't, for example, or she, was not willing to fill it up? Otherwise, it would be such a waste of space. Such a waste of space. And indeed, one of the philosophers argued in that perspective is that why would the universe, universe be so large uh, if it were not intended for some purpose, such as filling it with life? We now are on the brink of learning about the existence or absence, but probably the existence of life elsewhere in the universe with measurements. No longer will we have to rely on the notion of, does it make sense that there's so much space, that the universe is so large? Rather, we will measure, as I'll try to show you, we will measure the presence of life on other planets orbiting other stars. And that will be something to remain healthy, to live to see that day when the first, when the first forms of life are discovered on other planets around other stars, as well as perhaps even on some objects within our own solar system. So I'm going to describe for you, uh, give you a 50,000 foot view of astrobiology. And let me add that it's a privilege uh, to work with colleagues at RPI in the Earth and Environmental Science Department, the Physics and Astronomy uh, Departments, and the Chemistry Department at RPI as well as colleagues at Syracuse University, University of Arizona, and University of North Carolina. We've recently, just two weeks ago, received word from NASA uh, that our Astrobiology Institute proposal was funded, uh, only one of 10 in the United States funded, and it's a real privilege uh, to work uh, with these colleagues. Some of the Philosophers 
who have weighed in on the idea of the presence or absence of life elsewhere in the universe are shown here. Uh, those that are shown in white uh, were those who said, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. No, there's no life out there. Of course, their view of the universe was fundamentally different than what ours is today, of course. The universe was quite small. Uh, by all standards by, by which we measure today. Uh, but you can see that, the, uh, that the, the, the opinion was split. Astrobiology is what NASA has uh, developed because of the following. Uh, NASA believes uh, that a great nation should answer great questions. And one of the great questions that we thought that we could answer at this, at this time in the 20th, 21st century is, is there life out, out there? How did life form here? What, it's, what is its likelihood elsewhere in the universe? And you can see that it is a multidisciplinary approach involving principally these, uh, these different sciences. And for those uh, young people in the audience, I would suggest that this could really be an exciting area to consider uh, for uh, pursuing, in which you consider chemistry, microbiology, geochemistry, astrophysics, planetary science, any of those specialties, and, and work hard. Find out, have a conversation between your heart and with your head as to what it is that you really have a passion to do, because those of us who have been privileged to be scientists in our career, have had that conversation and have it regularly. Uh, and what you do with passion, you will usually exceed at, uh, excel at. So it's a multidisciplinary approach because all of these sciences, all of them, have a story to tell, a page to write in this complex story of the origin of life, which we are only beginning to touch the surface on, but I'll give you a sense of that tonight. It is really exciting. <laughs> Some of the questions that are coming to the fore are, are questions that uh, 10 years ago, only 10 years ago, uh, we couldn't have said, well, that's a nice question, but it's pretty useless from a scientific sense because we cannot address it. Uh, many of the questions that you see before you now, are planets common in the universe? Well, 10 years ago, again, it would have been, well, I guess, with 10 to the 22 stars in the universe, why should there be a shortage of planets? But wouldn't it be better to measure? So we did. So now we have a pretty good idea of the answer to that question, are planets common? Because as you know, planets are where you would expect life to be, life as we know it. Life existing on stars seems a stretch. In what, in what ways is planet Earth unusual compared to stars, uh, planets that we find around other stars? Well, again, 10 years ago, a nice question, but unanswerable. Now, you'll see. Is life likely to be carbon-based? And you can see many of the questions here. Is intelligence inevitable during evolution? It took us, took this planet uh, nearly four plus billion years to arrive at life at our level of, you know, of intelligence. Gosh, if it took four billion years every place else or more, what does that, what does that bode for the rest of the universe? Or could there be circumstances on other planets where evolution would move, would move quicker than it moved here. Is intelligence inevitable? So these are some of the questions we'll look at tonight, and we're going to race along here, so buckle up. Uh, what is life, of course, to begin with? And, and there are a number of ways, of course, that we could define life, but one, one way I think that makes sense is the one that you see before you here, where primitive life is an aqueous chemical system, so it involves water, as we understand water as being very important to us. Uh, mole molecules that carry information, such as DNA and RNA that we're all familiar with, and also capable of evolving. Evolving is very important because what you start with is not good enough. 
What you start with will be very simple, and you need then time uh, to work for you to develop a, a huge uh, diversity of life forms. The concept of evolution then is something we're all familiar with and is essential uh, for producing uh, the diversity of life that we find on this planet and probably elsewhere. So the first question, and I'm, I'm going to show you that I am an earth chauvinist. I'm a carbon chauvinist uh, by making the following argument. Uh, that is, uh, I, I have to admit before making this argument that I, I am a card-carrying Star Trek fan. Uh, that, and I hope some, a few of you are also. It, one, of the, one of the great uh, series of human history. Uh, Star Trek, whether it's the great, the greatest gener, uh, you know, the greatest gener, uh, next generation or the original Star Trek. Uh, but uh, is is life uh, silicon-based life? Of course, is one of, was one of the episodes in the original Star Trek. But I'd like to argue, uh, suggest to you at least, uh, suggest to you tonight that suggest to you that carbon, uh, carbon is likely to be a common. Uh, basis for life elsewhere in the universe because carbon, well, first of all, let me describe what this graph is. It looks pretty, pretty strange. Uh, this is the x-axis is showing you the atomic number, the atomic number. So all of us know on the periodic table of the elements, we're looking at atomic number, number of protons in the nucleus of atoms. And that is the definition, of course, of, of elements. And on this logarithmic scale on the y-axis here, we're looking at the relative abundances of the atoms uh, in this part of our galaxy. Notice then that, not surprisingly, hydrogen and helium are the two most abundant elements in, in the sun, but also in the galaxy. Notice also that carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen are very abundant also. They're some of the most, uh, most abundant elements uh, in, in this galaxy are carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Silicon, silicon, notice, is about a factor of 10 less abundant in numbers of atoms, is only one-tenth the number of silicon atoms in the galaxy as there are carbon atoms. Put another way, carbon atoms are 10 times more abundant in the galaxy than silicon atoms. Oxygen, you see, is also a very important element. And you know, of course, that we are made of these kinds of elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and other major and, and elemental ingredients for life. We are made of common stuff. Carbon also has the advantage of forming a multiplicity of different kinds of bonds with hydrogen uh, that makes life as we understand it uh, so possible and so diverse and so wondrous. Silicon, on the other hand, and not to knock silicon. After all, as a geochemist, I'd be, it would be a sacrilege to knock silicon uh, too savagely. Uh, but silicon, as you know, uh, makes the, the variety of minerals uh, that we find on this planet and other rocky planets in our solar system. That's a rich variety, uh, rich variety of minerals. Uh, but the variety of minerals that we find on Earth, for example, very rich, is measured only in the thousands. But the kinds of atoms uh, or molecules that can be formed with carbon and hydrogen bonding uh, is in the tens of thousands. Carbon is a much, much uh, more diverse uh, forming uh, a, a building block for forming molecules than silicon is uh, at all. So uh, the, the shorthand uh, summary of that would be, I, I would suggest to you that when we find life elsewhere, it is likely to be carbon-based because of the intrinsic chemistry of carbon, the high abundance of silicon, but also the high abundance of carbon itself compared to silicon. Silicon, I, I mentioned, of course, because silicon plots below uh, carbon on the periodic table and therefore has uh, an, ele an electron configuration in the outer electron shells uh, similar uh, to that of carbon. 
So what, what was it that gave rise to the, the huge variety of life on Earth? And this is, is one notion of what the early Earth might have looked like, uh, perhaps uh, more than 4.3 billion years ago. Now why would we get, why, why could we even have permission uh, to show uh, this kind of cartoon about what the early Earth might have looked like? Because there are things on Earth that remember these times. There are little crystals, and some of those crystals are so small that you could get them in your eye and you would barely notice them. But with modern technology, such crystals can be interrogated. We can interrogate them with, with beams of high, high energy beams uh, that extracts atoms and isotopes from very small portions of those crystals and can then interrogate them. What do you remember? We know you remember something. Tell us what you remember. And we ask them questions. And, and those questions are imagination limited. But those questions that we ask of those minerals begin to tell us some fascinating things about the history of this planet. And that is, the Earth appears to have once had oceans far, far earlier than we would have ever imagined. Now to give you, set the, set the context of this, uh, let's imagine this, this being now, zero years in the past, and this being the beginning of the Earth-Moon system back here at 4,560,000,000 years or 4,560. It's an easy number to remember, you know? Wow. <laughs> Who would have guessed that, right? That's a good one. Uh, 4,567 million years ago was the origin of the Earth-Moon system. And when did the core drop? and it's made of metals, a, a complex alloy of iron, nickel, and other, other metals that uh, gravitationally from, uh, dropped to the center of the Earth, but once was dispersed, and it dropped uh, down, and it heated up the Earth's, the gravitational potential energy of that core forming uh, ended up heating the entire interior of the Earth by nearly 2,000 degrees centigrade just by redistributing metal, boom, down to the center. Well, when did that happen? When did the crust, when did much of the crust form? When did the mantle form? When did the mantle outgas to form an atmosphere? A different one that we have today. But when did all that happen? You see that little green thing right there? It was all over. Everything was done within that, here's when the Earth started, and here is when the Earth finished going through all of the major gravitational geochemical separation of the elements uh, that we see today. That small interval right there, it, was, it, would, have been, it would have been fun to watch, <laughs> really, from a distance. Uh, because also during that time, probably around this smidge here, is when we got smacked uh, by a Mars-sized object at just the right angle to make the moon. These were exciting times. And yet, what it's important to realize is that once this heavy lifting, heavy geochemical lifting, where you separate the elements into their various respective reservoirs inside a planet, now the stage is set. The stage is set for the origin of oceans, a stable atmosphere, and, per, and then the, the, the origin of life itself. Things went quickly, and that's good, because that gives us plenty of time uh, to get a lot of things done with respect to biochemistry and geochemistry. Now the moon is, is of course, our neighbor, and we have visited it six times with uh, American Apollo crews. 
uh, and the Soviets robotically returned some samples. What could the moon possibly tell us of any importance or any interest about the origin of the Earth and possibly even the origin of life? Is that, notice there are a lot of craters. This neighborhood has really been beaten up. A lot of craters. And it's now apparent from the analysis, ongoing analysis of the Apollo uh, samples, is that most of the craters and this, these, this place, the light-colored areas on the moon, are saturated with craters, craters on craters on craters on craters. And it appears that most of them were formed in a short interval of time around 3 billion, 900 million years ago. 600 to 700 million years after the moon formed, bang, all heck broke loose uh, with a bombardment known as the late uh, late heavy bombardment. Really? Well, what happened to life at that time? If life was on Earth in some primitive form, it witnessed that bombardment uh, 3.9 billion years ago. And uh, we're trying to figure out uh, what life could have survived it, because here would be a scenario. You see these see these large circular basins which are now filled with dark colored lava those are impact basins the one up here that's the size of New York State that's one hole the size of New York State produced during one impact event three billion nine hundred million years ago that was a bad day <laughs> now if something like that were to have struck the earth and the Earth's cross-section, uh, both from area and also gravity, means that whatever the moon got, we got more than 10 times more. So similar objects were hitting the Earth. And such an object as that, hitting the Earth, would have boiled the oceans. Just think about that. When you have a bad Monday, when you have a bad Monday, well, at least the oceans didn't boil, you know? <laughs> uh, because can you imagine what that would be? Literally, the oceans, the oceans vaporize. And now you have 250 bars of steam. And then it rains a lot as it cools. Uh, it's just, just horrific. But what kind of, of life could have possibly walked away from that? And, uh, The base of the tree of life, as we currently understand it from biochemistry, is in fact rooted. Uh, the earliest, most primitive organisms on Earth from which all life uh, has developed are the kinds of life that could have survived that. They were the survivors. So the moon has been providing us yet another uh, way of addressing one part of the, of the question about the origin of life and its distribution in space. And we study at RPI and at, at the University at Albany and uh, the University of Arizona and also at, the, at Syracuse University, uh, small little uh, droplets of glass, only about 100 microns across. And these are the things which we extract memory and ask each one of them, what was the history of the moon uh, back nearly 3 billion, 900 million years ago? So as we think about what the Earth uh, was like a long time ago when, when life formed, we find that it was a, an unfamiliar place. Yes, the geochemical reservoirs had occurred. That's good. Uh, and there were oceans probably sloshing around for the last 43 to 4,400 million years. Uh, but life went through a lot. We came from good stock. But now let's, let's ask ourselves, uh, what about uh, life elsewhere? I haven't addressed the issue of Earth being unique or special. I'll leave that to the end. Has, has whatever Earth gone through uh, been common, like most other planets, or has it had anything special that would have promoted the, the huge, rich biochemistry that we see here today? So. Uh, is complex life common or rare in the universe? And by, by complex, I could uh, suggest that 
complex would be chipmunks and beyond. Uh, chipmunks and beyond, complex life involving uh, a, a low tolerance for variations in temperature. We don't have a high tolerance of temperature. We live in a very narrow temperature range. We live in a very narrow atmospheric chemistry range, a very narrow pH range. Uh, we are very sensitive complex critter, critters ourselves. And that's true of complex life as, as I'm trying to uh, define it here. So let's, let's take a look. Astronomers have done, done some very bold things, remarkable things in the last 10 years. And, and this is one illustration of the, the genius uh, that, is, that outcrops in science and, and all professional fields from time to time. Uh, this is the search for extrasolar planets uh, using the wobble of stars. And probably many of you have heard about the wobbling of stars. Uh, stars wobble when they have uh, other masses going around them. And I, I'd like to ask you a question. First of all, notice that as of tonight, about 228 planets are known, known uh, and have been measured uh, to exist around other stars in our neighborhood of, the, of our own galaxy. That's a pretty good, pretty good census, and that will shortly increase. Now the question is, and those of you who have taken multiple guest questions know, of course, that this is a trick question. And the question is, the Earth goes around the sun. True or false? And you would all answer, well, of course it's true. I learned that, in, I learned that throughout my entire schooling, that Earth goes around the sun. Wasn't that what Copernicus was made famous for. And, and that's, that's true, but uh, it's close, but it's not exactly correct. It's, it's close. What actually happens is uh, that stars and planets uh, orbit a common center of mass. There isn't anything there. You would say, I'm standing at the center of mass, but I don't see anything. You don't have to. It's the center of mass of a complex system where you have a mass, large mass of a star with a planet. And as I step through these little time steps here, you will see, you will see that the planet is, uh, is going around this star, and the star is wobbling. That the planet is going around the star, and the star and the planet stay on opposite sides of that center of mass. So if you are an astronomer looking from, from our position here, for, for example, along a line of sight here, you would see that the star would be coming toward you in some instances and going away from you at other times. So just watch, keep that in mind. Going away from the Going, from an, going away from an, uh, from an observer in this direction here, coming toward the observer, going away from the observer, coming toward the observer. And those very sensitive measurements of stars wobbling, wobbling, uh, can now be measured uh, to a gnat's eyelash. To a gnat's eyelash, it is magic. Uh, the way some astronomers have been able to do this. Uh, they are able to measure uh, the relative speed of us relative to another star to a speed equivalent to a fast walk. We know the precision, we know the relative speed of us relative to a, another star in the galaxy to an accuracy of the speed that I'm moving now. And I think you'll agree, that's not bad. Considering that, that we are moving through our own, we are orbiting through around our sun at about, what is it, 18 kilometers per second. We are also moving through the galaxy. And we also have this troublesome object around us called the moon 
that is also, you know, if you're on the, if you're on the Earth, you're pointing at a star, and meanwhile the moon is, is, is playing mind games with you. You know, it's causing the Earth to wobble uh, as you do this as well. So there's a lot of, of complex physics uh, that goes into being able to uh, sh be able to measure, and we haven't even begun to, t uh, to show you the, the, uh, the technology and brains and, and computing horsepower that goes into that. But once you get that, then you pull out signals such as this. And this is orbital period. This is time from the beginning of an orbit to the end of one orbit of a planet around a star. And this is the speed that the star was moving away from the observer, 40 meters per second moving away from the observer, 30 to 40 meters toward the observer. And you can see that over time, you can see that this star was moving away, but it wasn't moving away as fast. And then it changed direction, was coming toward the observer and then it was not coming toward us as fast, and then it changed direction and moved away quickly, and then moved away less quickly. And you can see that this forms a nice curve. What does that mean? What it means is you measure the time, that's one orbit, and in this case here, this is one planet orbiting one star with a period, orbital period, of 3.971 Earth days. 3.971 Earth days. What's the orbital period of Mercury around the Sun? 88 days. 88 days. Here is a planet going around a solar mass star with a, with a period of four days. What does that tell you about this place? Roasty toasty. Roasty toasty. It is really, really close really tight into that star and with a period of less than four Earth days. The amplitude, the amplitude of this also gives you an estimate of the mass. If it had been a dweeby little planet with a four day period on it, you would have still had this curve, but it would have been, it would have been a very low amplitude curve. Same period but just low amplitude. So the depth of, of motion of that curve gives you the mass of the planet relative to the star. That's not bad. And then the shape of this curve, you can see it's a sinusoidal curve, uh, tells you that the eccentricity is zero. This is a circular orbit. Now, Take a look at this one. Here's another star with another planet uh, orbiting it, and that's the data for that star. What's going on there? Clearly not a sinusoidal curve, clearly a lot different. What's going on there? And what's going on there, as you may have suspected, again, time. Notice the time is no longer in days, uh, but rather in years. The shift toward us and away from us is in hundreds, nearly, you know, approaching nearly a hundred or a hun more than a hundred meters per second. And the shape is not a sine curve. Uh, what this shows you, as you probably already guessed, is that this is a massive planet that has a highly elliptical orbit around its star. Highly elliptical orbit. So during a small interval of its orbit, it is really close to that star. Comes in, spends most of its time a long ways away, and then comes, comes in. So it's a, a freezing, boiling, freezing uh, kind of setting with a period measured, as you can see, of going from this part of the orbit to the same part of the orbit over here. You're looking at about a four year or so orbit uh, for this planet. So here you get a sense of, yeah, there are some planets out there with circular orbits, but there also appear to be planets out there with highly non-circular orbits, elliptical orbits. 
So then you look at stars like this one. I'll give you a minute to, to look at those data. Time, 1988 uh, to 2003. Or 2002, I guess, when the data stop right there, 2002. Again, the relative motion of the star with respect to us. What's going on there? Let me point out that the uncertainty on each of those data points, notice these bars here show you the uncertainty on those data points. And as you progress through time, you see that most of those uncertainties eventually, as the technology got better, that the uncertainties on those data points got smaller and smaller and smaller until they were comparable to the size of the, of the data points themselves. So the scatter that you're seeing here is not analytical. It's five planets. It's a star being tugged, not by one, but at least five planets. This is the signal from five planets. Could there be more? Yep. Probably more. And we'll shortly uh, be able to detect uh, the presence of even smaller planets in this system. Here's one of the, I think, one of the, I would ask you to take this one home with you. Burn it into the frontal lobes. Just burn, fry it. Just, 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 you know, just, just burn it right into the frontal lobes. Because this is one of those general, uh, general uh, take-home messages uh, that bears on the question of, is, is this solar system common or rare in the galaxy? Are we a dime a dozen, or are we quite unusual? This answers that question in a, in a startling way. Notice that what we're looking at here is to identify what the axes are. We're looking at uh, the, the, the distance between the, the planet and the star in, a, in astronomical units. Earth orbits at one astronomical unit from our, from our sun, for example. And then the y-axis is showing you the shape of the orbits of these planets. Every dot is a planet. Every dot that you see here is an extrasolar planet, an exoplanet. Every planet, every point, point you see here is a world orbiting another star. And notice that we go from zero up to one, and zero means circle. Circle, circular orbit. With the exception of Mercury and Pluto, all of the planets in our solar system, all of them, have eccentricities that are darn close to zero, all the way across. Earth would plot about here. Mars would plot about here. Jupiter would plot about here. Saturn would plot out here someplace. Uranus out here. Neptune out there. You get the point that most of the planets in our solar system have circular orbits. What do you notice about this? Most planets in our galaxy don't. Most, uh, most planets in our galaxy are highly elliptical. <clears throat> now what would that mean in terms of climate? Wow. Major challenges in climate. That the benign climate that we find here, where our winters are subtly different than our summers. Wow a lot different in the rest of the galaxy. This is thought to be a representative slice of what other planets in our galaxy are like. 
And the take home message is, this is an unusual solar system. Okay, but uh, I wonder if Earths are common. I wonder if Earths are Earth-sized planets are common or rare. Here's the second one to burn into the frontal lobes because this suggests that small planets like Earth are common. Notice that we're looking at the estimates for masses in Jupiter relative to the mass of Jupiter, 10 times the mass of Jupiter, 6 times the mass of Jupiter, 2. Uh, the distribution of planets that have so far been found show this uh, general approximation that you see here. And what you see is there are not many planets out there that are supermassive. They would be the easiest ones to detect, but they're not found. The smallest ones, which would be more challenging to detect and therefore might be underrepresented, are abundant. So, although we cannot yet detect, but next year we will, be able to detect Earth-sized planets, it appears, based on these data here, notice that this curve goes way up. As you get to smaller and smaller masses, it goes way up. And this is number of planets. As a function of mass, the lower the mass of the planet, the larger the number of those planets are. There are very few supermassive planets. There are large numbers of small planets. Earth's, Earth-sized planets will be a dime a dozen. They won't be in circular orbits. That's disappointing. Uh, but they will be a dime a dozen. The next strategy for being able, and I'm going to wrap it up here shortly, is, is this. Here's another search strategy uh, that's going to be uh, tried by a U.S. spacecraft beginning next March. It's currently being used by a, a European Space Agency uh, spacecraft uh, successfully, but with much less resolution and, and uh, sensitivity than the one that, we'll, that the United States will launch next March. It's a, it's a transit method transit method. So here is, a, here is a painting of a star, hypothetical star, in which the plane of the orbits, so you're the observers on Earth with a star, you're looking at a point of light, only a point. You cannot resolve the disk on the star. You're looking at a point. And then a, a planet drifts between you and the star. What happens to the brightness of the star? It dims, just dims ever so slightly. And that's what you see here uh, being portrayed is a transit. Dimming of a star no longer wobbles because the wobble cannot be used for very small planets like, such as Earth. For example, how much does the Earth tug at the sun? Jupiter moves the sun at about 10 to 12 meters per second. Jupiter's a heavy lifter, you know, it just, mm, it demands attention, you know. Uh, but what does, what does the Earth do with respect to the sun? How much does the Earth tug at the sun? Four centimeters per second. Four centimeters, that's not even two inches. I mean, that, that planet has to be ashamed of itself. It's, it's less than two inches per second. The Earth moves the sun at less than two, two inches per second. That is so dweeby. So uh, we, we cannot, um, the Doppler method, the wobble method, cannot be used uh, to, to look for and detect uh, Earth-sized objects, which is, of course, we'd all be interested in, it, in small planets because they seem to be so abundant. So the, the, uh, this is now going to be the method of choice for looking for planets, large numbers of planets. So I'll show you quickly what we're in for. Uh, one, of the, one of the first transits uh, that was observed around another star is shown here. 
It was first detected from the ground, predicted from the ground, and observed from ground-based instruments. And then Hubble, a wonderful instrument, of course, in low Earth orbit, uh, was able to then say, OK, that star goes through a transit. OK, let's train our instruments on it and watch a transit. And what you see here is brightness, uh, full brightness being indicated as one, full brightness. And then when it's 1% dimmer, so 99% of full brightness would be 0 0.990. And 1.5% less than full brightness is 0.98. And what you see is the light curve occurring uh, as Hubble watched a single star as a planet uh, drifted in front of it over the course of about three hours. Three hours. And you can see it's about 1%, 1.5% dimming. And from that, uh, knowing the size of the star and knowing that it took about three hours to go across the front of that star and the quantity of dimming of that that caused by that planet, you can figure out how big the, uh, the planet is. But we already knew its mass from the wobble. The wobble already gave you the mass of the planet. This dimming gives you the diameter of the planet. What can you get? Mass and the diameter of the planet are now known. What might you infer you could derive? The, the density of the planet. Yeah, the density of the planet just falls right out. Uh, so the density of this planet, 0.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, this is a planet which is a gas giant orbiting within uh, so close to that star that it is orbiting every three days. It is a PV equals NRT experiment, ideal gas law. So when you get, if you're a gas giant, and you're in real close to a star, you know, you just really blow up. And this, that's why its density is so low. It is really hot. So, astronomers said, great, the, this transit method works. Okay, now, let's kick it up a notch. You know, that's emeralds, um, for those of you who watch the cooking show, let's kick it up a notch. So, we would like to use it to detect Earth-sized planets, not super Jupiters. So what would that take? Uh, it would take, a com anyway, we're looking at this aerial, uh, the area of a disk of the planet compared to the area of a disk of the star that it's orbiting around. And what you have to do is get really good at measuring that dimming. And it, it's 80 parts per million. It's 0.008% dimming. We were just looking at 1.6% dimming. To detect an Earth-sized object around another star, you are not looking at a 1.6% dimming. You are looking at a 0.008% dimming if you want to detect an Earth-sized object around a star. So the scientists at NASA said, OK, let's do it. So they will do it. So what does, what, does, uh, what does that look like on this graph? So this is what we're currently able to do with Hubble. So you can see what Hubble's doing. You, you, I'm, I would bet all of you looked at that and said, boy, that Hubble's great. You know? I mean, isn't that wonderful? Wow. How could it ever get better than that? Well, it's going to get a lot better than that because uh, that's what Hubble did. As great as that is, that's 16,000 parts per million difference. 16, I'm trying to cast it in terms of parts per million because the 20 parts per million detection limit of the spacecraft we're going to launch in March is, you see that red bar? Well, divide it into 50s. And that's going to be the detection limit of the U.S. spacecraft that will be launched next, next March. So this is what we're currently able to do with great, great, you know, alacrity. But if you want to detect Earth-sized objects, you have to do a lot better than that. So, you know, the size of that laser pointer right there is too big. 
So the, to detect an Earth-sized object, is, you're going to really have to try hard. So this is what it's going to look like. It's called Kepler. Uh, celebrate when, when Kepler gets into orbit. Celebrate, because boy, is that going to be a day. It's going to be great. You can see it's going to look at you know, a mere 100,000 stars. Just say, OK, we're in a solar orbit. It's not going to be in orbit around the Earth. A solar orbit, we're going to stare at a part of the sky for a couple of years. We're going to be looking at about 100,000 stars at once, continuously, 24-7, 365. We're going to be measuring not all the stars. We're not interested in all the stars we're seeing. We're just interested in 100,000 of them. So we will look at them, and we will be digitally measuring the brightness of every one of those stars continuously looking for 20 part per million dips in their brightness. Because when you see that, you will say, uh-huh, there's something there. There's something there. And the estimate is that several hundred Earth-sized planets will be measured in its four-year four mission. Several hundred Earths will be discovered. Something to look forward to. So just again to get, put you some sense of what the detection limit is for, for Kepler, here is 13 parts per million, a little bit smaller than what Kepler will be able to detect. But here is the sun, our sun, and there's Mercury. It would be just about able to detect a planet causing that much dimming as Mercury does on our star. And that's, that's just, they're really serious about trying to find small planets. Uh, the next step is, is this one, and we'll end at, at the next uh, couple of slides. And this is the one to, uh, to really, really stay tuned for, because after, after multiple spacecraft, European, uh, American, and perhaps Japanese, Chinese, and Indian uh, spacecraft do their job and create a grand census, a grand census of the planets out there uh, terrestrial Planet Finder, Terrestrial Planet Finder, still in the design stage, still in the concept stage, is going to say, okay, we now have a sense of what's out there. Now we also know something about the masses of the planets, their orbits, their environments. Let's now find out who's there. Literally, who's there? So what it will be doing is capturing the light coming from those planets, strategically selected planets from the large census that's been developed. They are going to interrogate the light coming from specific planets and doing the following. Measuring its spectrum. Measure the spectrum of light. Now those photons have been there. Those photons have been there. They have been to those planets, and those photons of light are coming to us. Terrestrial Planet Finder is capturing those photons and asking, what's there? You've been there. What's there? And the spectrum will tell us, is there water vapor there? If there is, you'll get these very deep absorption bands from water vapor. This is a signature. This will be a signature. The light will carry with it information about what's there. And if there's oxygen, molecular oxygen, what are you, nuts? No self-respecting, lifeless planet would ever have molecular oxygen uh, in its atmosphere. Uh, but uh, you can see if it does have molecular oxygen in its atmosphere, uh, molecular oxygen has a strong absorption band that will say, there's oxygen here. And if there's methane, or carbon dioxide, or water vapor, or other things, of course, that we all know as being really important for life as we know it, it'll show up. If there's, if there's CFCs there, it'll show up, you know? Something will show up. Why do we have 
21% oxygen, molecular oxygen in our atmosphere. Plants. Plants. So, here's a thought experiment. If there's anybody out there, on any planets out there, somewhere in the galaxy, with a technology 10 years, 10, not 10,000, 10 years better than ours, they already know this place is crawling. Because they will have already measured methane in the atmosphere, molecular oxygen in the atmosphere, and water vapor in the atmosphere. They already know with technology that we will have in 10 years, they already know this place is alive. And that is something that we will know in about 10 years. That's going to be a day and a half, I'm telling you. Wow, won't that be something? To be able to point up at the sky and say, not only are there 12 planets around that star, but two of them are now known to have life. Wouldn't that be a kick? And for those of you who are very young who ha and will eventually become parents, and you will take your little children outside and you will say, look at that star up there. It has 12 planets, two of which have life. And they'll say, mm, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? You know, so what? Oh, but, but you know, we didn't always know that. And what will they say? You must be so old, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but there is, these are exciting times. These are exciting times. Plato, Aristotle, Copernicus, and all others speculated and wondered. These were interesting questions. We, we the living of this generation, will learn, begin to know uh, some of the things that, we, that, they have, that they were so excited to know. We will measure them. So, in summary then, life is composed of common elements. And I would suggest to you that most life that we will probably find may turn out to be uh, carbon-based. I am so confident of that. I've put a quarter in a mayonnaise jar and, and sealed it. I'm, I'm betting a, a week's allowance. Uh, prebiotic molecules are common. We didn't touch, that, touch on that, but meteorites uh, contain amino acids. Uh, the basic building blocks, just not living, but the basic building blocks of life are common in the galaxy. Planets, planets are common. Planets are common. At least 20%, at least 20% of all stars of solar type and smaller in our galaxy have planets. Ten years ago, you could have said, well, I bet you're one in a billion. Well, that still would have given you a lot of planets. But uh, we, it's now clear that at least one in five stars have planets. And that means, wow. Most planets, however, do not have circular orbits. What effect that has on rates of evolution and the likelihood of life elsewhere uh, remains to be seen. Uh, Earth-sized planets appear to be common, as you see there. Life may be common, and the familiar notion is the following. Life will be common elsewhere. It will be common. Uh, the complex life uh, may, however, be rare. Stay tuned. As you peer into the galaxy, then, as you peer into the galaxy, I'd like to leave you with the possibility that life might be common. But that complex life might be rare. That most planets do not have circular orbits. That although life might be one-celled organisms, might be prolific, uh, throughout the universe, 
that complex life forms, sentient life forms, may be rare. I'd like to leave you with this. And I don't mean it to be discouraging, because I don't like being discouraging. I hope you've gotten that sense. I don't want to be discouraging. This is exciting stuff. Uh, so study hard. Study hard and, and stay well. These, wow, are we in for a treat. Uh, but Lauren Isley, a, a great writer and, and anthropologist and great scholar, uh, wrote in 1957 the following, and I'll leave you with it. As you peer into the, have the deepest view of the universe ever acquired by human beings, every point on this slide, every point of light you see there is a galaxy. There are, what, what's that? Two stars. <laughs> Sue tells me there are two stars up there. Okay. All of this minus two. <laughs> yeah. Take, take two. Three. Three, okay. Four? <laughs> Four. Uh, a, cu a couple. Less than a dozen. Uh, so we're looking at everything else out there is, is a galaxy. And galaxies, of course, contain upwards of 100 billion stars. Uh, each, uh, and we've now get a sense that there are even more than that number of planets. So Lauren Isley wrote, as you stare billions of light years into a typical part of space, and for those of you who want to know how much sky is being transected here, take a straw, take a soda straw, and peer through it. Yes, the soda straw is eight feet long, eight foot long soda straw and you peer through it, that doesn't give you much sky to look at. But that's the sky that you're seeing here. This is a represent, this is just what typical universe looks like. Isley wrote, but nowhere in all space or on a thousand worlds will there be humans to share our loneliness. There may be wisdom, there may be power, somewhere across space Great instruments handled by strange manipulative organs may stare vainly at our cloud rack, their owners yearning as we yearn. Nevertheless, in the nature of life and in the principles of evolution, we have had our answer of human...